Thank you, Mr. President. I, I would like to give what I think we call here our, my farewell address. We'd spent a lot of time in the office uh, writing out a, a long speech, and once I read it, I realized it really is more emotional than I thought, and we've set that speech aside. And last night, I made myself a lot of notes of uh, what I wanted to say, um, and then I realized this morning that was really just trying to get the last word in on a lot of the politics we've been discussing. So I set that aside and just uh, decided to, um, to speak from my heart for a few minutes. Certainly this is much more emotional than I thought, and as I look around this room, the, the realization that I'm standing here on the Senate floor speaking for the last time is a, is a lot to digest, and certainly it makes me very appreciative of the privilege we've all been given by the American people, and pr particularly those who've come before us, who have given their lives for us to have the opportunity to settle our differences in a civil and democratic way. So this is a, a great opportunity and a privilege to um, just share a few thoughts before I go on to the next phase of my life. I, I first have to um, give my particular thanks to my wife, Debbie, who for the last 15 years has spent many days and nights alone uh, as I have tried to come up here and change things in Washington. She's often reminded me uh, or questioned how I thought I could change the world when I couldn't even mow the grass, uh, but uh, she has been a, a supporter and certainly so important as I left uh, my children who were still in school and I began serving in the house. Um, kept them on the right track, and I particularly want to thank them. All of you who served here know that um, when we sign up for public life, we also sign our families up for public life. In a lot of ways, it makes their lives much more difficult. So I, I want to thank uh, my children, my wife, Debbie, and family for putting up with this and being such a support. I also have to uh, thank the people of South Carolina who've entrusted me with this job in the Senate for the last eight years and the House six years before that. Uh, all of you know who served um, or for your states, as you've traveled around and met people and toured businesses and spoken to groups, it really creates a deep love and an appreciation for the people back home. I, I look at what we're making in South Carolina and these small businesses you drive by not knowing anything's there. And, and you go in and find that they're making things and shipping things all over the world. It just makes you very proud of, um, of, of what we're doing in South Carolina. And I know all of you feel the same way about your states. And I'm very appreciative of the people of, of South Carolina who have given me this opportunity. Very grateful to my colleagues who I've often uh, uh, scrapped with on a lot of um, issues. Uh, I appreciate their patience on both sides. Um, I think I can leave here claiming to have good friends who are Democrats and Republicans. I'm a pr uh, particularly grateful for a lot of the new senators, some who are sitting here today, who I've had the opportunity working with their peop uh, folks in their states and all around the country to elect some new people to the Senate uh, that are bringing the right ideas and some new voices uh, to those principles that uh, we know have made our country successful. And so I feel like as I leave the Senate that we're leaving it uh, better than we found it and uh, that our focus now, despite the difficult challenges, is really on America and how we turn America around. I, I should spend a, a lot of time and most of my time on um, thanking my staff I have to say that my greatest inspirations have come from the staff that I've had the opportunity to serve with in the House and the Senate. Um, as all of you know who are serving here in the Senate, that this country is being run by people in their 20s and 30s who get us so busy that uh, they're having to follow us to meetings to tell us where we're going and what we'll be talking about. But it's incredible to see that uh, these young people, particularly those that I've served with, have such a passion for our country and freedom, and they're willing to put it all on the line to, um, to make a difference here. And I'm 
they feel a lot like my family, and I'm, I'm certainly going to miss them, but it's encouraging to see them moving to other offices and taking their ideas uh, and that courage to other places on the Hill. I want to add my thanks to all the Hill staff, you folks sitting around the front here and those who've worked with us. I know sometimes we've, we've pressed the envelope a little bit on things that we were trying to get done, and I've seen um, a, a lot of very um, uh, intelligent, uh, active, and engaged uh, staff all across the Hill, both Democrat and Republican, and I'm very thankful for, for what you do. <clears throat> About 15 years ago, I started campaigning for the House. I'd never run for public office. At that time, I believed, and I think it still holds true today, that there were normal people like me, and then there were politicians. Uh, I was a businessman. I'd had a small business for about 15 years. I had four children. I was active in my church and the community. And I had begun to see that well-motivated, well-intended well government policies were make it harder for us to do the things at the community level that we know actually worked. And that's really what I've always been about here. It really was not about politics. Uh, I had really no strong political affiliation before I decided to run for office. But I, I saw ideas from the time I was a young person, uh, ideas that worked. And I actually saw this statement the other day that I'd like to, to read because it reflects what I think a lot of us know works in our country. And this is one thing I will try to read today. I do not choose to be a common man. It is my right to be uncommon. If I can seek opportunity, not security, I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. I refuse to barter incentive for dole. I prefer the challenges of life to guaranteed security, the thrill of fulfillment to the state of calm utopia. I will not trade freedom for beneficence, nor my dignity for a handout. I will never cower before any master save my God. It is my heritage to stand erect, proud and unafraid, to think and act for myself, enjoy the benefit of my creations, to face the whole world boldly, and say, I am a free American. I've seen this on a plaque called the American Creed. In South Carolina, at least, we've adopted this as what we call the Republican Creed. But it's really not a Republican idea or a political idea. It's an American idea. And the ideas in this statement are ideas that we all know work and ideas that we would hope for our children and everyone around us. We know that there are people all around us who are having difficulty, but this idea of helping them to become independent, self-sufficient, responsible, creates the dignity and fulfillment in their life that we know we want for all Americans. This is not for a small few. This is an American idea. And it's an idea that I know has worked in my life, and I've seen it work all around me. And, and that's what I'd like to talk about for just a second today, is not political ideas, but ideas that we can look back through history and all around us today and point to them and say, that's working. I think if we did that more here in the political sphere, we might could find a lot more consensus. As we look around the country today, we can see a lot of things that are working. Sometimes we couch them in our political rhetoric, but I can guarantee you they're not being done for political reasons at the state level. They're being done because they work and that they have to get things to work at the state level. We saw last week the state of Michigan adopted a new law that gave workers the freedom not to join a union. Now, they didn't do that because it was politically expedient 
or that they thought it was a good idea because it actually is probably going to get a lot of the politicians in hot water in Michigan. But what they did is looked at 23 other states who had adopted the same idea and saw that they were attracting businesses and creating jobs. And these states, without raising taxes, had more revenue to build schools and roads and, and hospitals. It was just an idea that worked. It's not a political idea to give pe people the freedom not to join a union. It's an American idea, and it's an idea that works. We can look around the country today, and again, we make these things political and give them uh, labels that are good or bad, depending on, I guess, which party you're in. But we know a number of states have been real innovative and creative with what they're doing in education. We see what they've done in Florida to create more choices, and in Louisiana particularly, forced by Hurricane Katrina to start a new system in effect. And they see that more, more choices and opportunities for parents to choose are helping low-income, at-risk kids, minority kids. We can see it working. And it's not political. It's an American idea to give parents more choices to put their children in an environment that they can succeed. It's an idea that works. You know, we could look around the country at states that try to create a more business-friendly environment, not because they're for businesses or for any political reason or, or they're for special interest, but they know the only re way to get jobs and prosperity and create opportunity is to create an environment where businesses can thrive. We make it political here, and we ask our constituents to make choices between employers and employees. But states like Texas have created a business-friendly environment with lower taxes and less regulation. They've passed some laws that reduce the risk of uh, just frivolous lawsuits. And what they've seen is businesses moving to their state. They've seen jobs and opportunity created, not for the top 2%, but expanding a middle class, creating more opportunities and more tax revenues to do the things at the state government level that we all want for everyone that lives there. This is not for a few. This is for 100%. And you see specials now on TV comparing California and Texas and businesses moving out and delegations from California going to Texas to try to figure out why businesses are moving and families are moving. Uh, it's not political at all. We make it political, and we talk about it in political terms, but creating an environment where businesses can thrive is an American idea, and it's an idea that's working. And we see it all over the country, where some states are going on one road with higher taxes and bigger government and more spending. And they're losing to states like te Texas and I hope more and more like South Carolina. They're moving to where they can thrive and this benefits every American. We look at energy development and we talk about that at the national level of how it can create prosperity for our country if we open it up. But we don't have to guess at whether or not it works. I mean, we can look at North Dakota. We can look at Pennsylvania. States that have gone around the federal rules and figured out how to develop their own energy are creating jobs and tax revenue to their governments. They were able to lower their taxes, use the revenue to improve everything about their states. And here we make it political and partisan of whether or not our country can develop more and more energy. But at the state level, it's just about what works. And all we have to do is look at what works. This is not rocket science. I came to Washington as a novice in politics, believing in the power of ideas seeing how ideas can revolutionize different industries, can create new products and services, meeting the needs of customers everywhere. And that's what I hoped we could do here in Washington. 
Maybe naively, I went to work in the house, often working with the Heritage Foundation, to, to create a better product here in Washington. I saw Social Security, and not too many people looked below the surface, but we knew it was going broke. We knew we were taking in money that people were paying for this Social Security retirement benefit, but we were spending it all. And I thought, what, what an opportunity it would be for future generations, for my children, if we actually saved what people were putting into Social Security for their retirement. And you didn't have to do too much math to see that even for middle class workers, that Americans could be millionaires when they retired if we even kept half of what was put into Social Security for them. It seemed like a good idea to create wealth and independence for individuals in retirement. But we made it a political idea and somehow convinced Americans that it was riskier to save their Social Security contribution than it was just to spend it. I'm leaving the Senate to work on ideas that I know work. I've seen them work all over our country. We can look all over our country and showcase these ideas that are working. And I know that they're power and ideas, but I've learned one thing about the political environment. Unless there's power behind the ideas, that they will not emerge here in the Congress. That there's too much pressure from the outside on the status quo or to protect some political interest. And no matter how much we show that it's working, it won't be adopted here unless we're able to win the argument with the American people. I spent most of my life in research and advertising and marketing and strategic planning. What I hope I can do from this point is to take these ideas and policies that I know work. And the Heritage Foundation for 40 years has been creating the research and analysis that show these policies work. And what I hope I can do is to help connect those ideas with real people real faces, and to show these people that these ideas are not theory, they're not political policies, but they're ideas that are working right at their state or the state right next to them. And if we can win the arguments, if we can win the hearts and the minds of the American people with these ideas, I know that we can engage them and enlist them to convince all of you here to set the politics aside, the parties aside, and to adopt those ideas that work. My hope is to make conservative ideas so pervasive, so persuasive across the country that politicians of all parties have to embrace those ideas to be elected. I'm not leaving here to be an advocate for the Republican Party. I, I hope that we can create more common ground between the political parties by showing everyone that ideas that work for their constituents and our constituents are right in front of our faces if we're willing to set aside the pressure groups, the special interests, and just focus on what's working. Over the next few years, we're going to see more and more states doing the right things, becoming more prosperous, creating a better environment for people to live and work. And we're going to see some states that will continue to raise taxes, to create more regulations, make it harder to start businesses, and to be profitable in those states. They will continue to lose businesses and people. And many of those states will come here to Washington and ask us to help them out from their bad decisions. I hope at that point that we can show by pointing at these states and these right ideas that we know the solutions at the state level and that we also know that we can change how we think here at the federal level and make our country work a lot better. I leave here with a lot of respect for my colleagues. I know my Democrat colleagues believe with conviction their ideas. And I know my Republican colleagues do too. But I hope we can look at the facts. I hope we can look at the real world. Hope we can look at what's working and set aside the politics 
and realize what really makes this country great and strong is when we move dollars and decisions out of Washington back to people and communities and to states, that it works, not for 2%, but for 100% of Americans. I feel like our customers as in the Senate, at the Heritage Foundation, or wherever we go, are 100% of Americans who these ideas can work for to build a better future and a stronger Americans. And I'm not leaving the fight. I hope to raise my game at my next phase. And I hope that I can work more closely with all of you, as well as governors and state legislators, to take these ideas and convince Americans, as well as their legislators, uh, their senators, and their congressmen, that we have the solutions all around them, all around us, if we have the courage to adopt, adopt them. I thank you for this opportunity to serve. Certainly, I'll miss my relationships but I hope that we'll have the opportunity to continue to work together for what is the greatest country in the world and what I believe a generation before us that could be the greatest and most prosperous generation of all if we just look to the ideas that work. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank my colleagues. Um, I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum.